Hello and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today for session four of Making African America, Immigration and the Changing Dynamics of Blackness, a virtual symposium. I'm Zita Nunes, Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Maryland. This session is titled Artistic Encounters, Literature, Music, and Art History. The panel addresses the diaspora through the lens of cultural production retention and offers dynamic examples of the meanings and legacies of migration. The session will explore how cultural productions in literature, music, and art both reflect and contribute to the complexity of encounters between African Americans and Black immigrants during the 20th century. I'm going to introduce our four panelists for this afternoon, each of whom will speak for 15 minutes. Um, their presentations will be followed by a question and answer period. Our first speaker, Silvio Torres Sayon, is Professor of English and Dean's Professor of Humanities in the College of Arts and Sciences at Syracuse University. He writes on the intellectual history of the Caribbean and the literature of the Caribbean diaspora. Doris Sayon's research is committed to understanding the enduring impact of the knowledges created by European colonizers of the region in the early modern period and overcoming the sense of difference that lingers from these intellectual frameworks. Our second speaker, um, Professor uh, Dagmar Wubschett, who you'll see um, on your screen, uh, you'll see his photograph on the screen. On the screen. Uh, he is currently in Addis and uh, the connection is poor. So you'll hear his voice, but you'll see his photograph on the screen. Um, so Dagmawi uh, Wubshet is a Huja Family Presidential Associate Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania and author of The Calendar of Loss, Race, Sexuality, and Mourning in the Early er Era of AIDS. His next book will examine the later writings of James Baldwin. Wubshet is interested in the intersections of African-American, um, LGBTQ, and African studies, as well as transatlantic studies, post-colonial literature, and comparative race and empire studies. Our third speaker, Jason McGraw, is Associate Professor of History at Indiana University, Bloomington. He is the author of The Work of Recognition, Caribbean, Columbia, and, and the Post-Emancipation Struggle for Citizenship. And he's currently at work on a book about the international history of Jamaican music. McGraw's teaching and research interests include race and gender in the Americas, the African diaspora, and the Atlantic world. Our final speaker, Mukomo Wangubi, is Associate Professor of English at Cornell University and a scholar of comparative African literature. He is the author of three novels and two books of poetry. His recent monograph, The Rise of the, of the African Novel, Politics of Language, Identity, and Ownership, examines earlier misreadings of African literature arguing that, that early South African literature influenced multiple transnational literatures, including that of the African independence era. So thank you, and Professor Sayon will get us started. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to begin by extending a brief word of gratitude to the coordinating team at the University of Maryland, namely Professor Julie Green, co-director of the Center for Global Migration Studies, the Center's Assistant Director, Katerina Akin, uh, 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 and to Professor Nancy uh, Raquel Mirabal, head of the Latino Latin American Studies program. Uh, a gratitude that I extend as well to the counterparts of, of these colleagues in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. 
uh, a note of appreciation also to the behind the scene IT personnel and overall technical support staff that have enabled us to meet virtually for this important series of presentations and conversations. Henry Louis Gates uh, Jr. recalls in the opening of his Black in Latin America, uh, both the uh, book and the, uh, and the uh, video documentary, that it was not until his sophomore year at Yale University in 1969, um, when he audited an art history uh, course taught by Professor Harris Thompson, that he came into meaningful awareness of the spread of the African presence in the Western Hemisphere outside of the United States. There is a way in which bl the Black uh, experience in the non North American side of the hemisphere has needed to be discovered and rediscovered again by every, gener every new generation of African Americans in the United States. The precarious visibility of African descended people in lands south of the Rio Grande uh, to their counterparts in the United States also renders precarious the visibility of the memory of the Latin American and Caribbean origins of many bona fide African Americans stemming from a history of migration from the south to the north of the hemisphere dating back to the colonial period. Martin Delaney's 1959 novel, uh, Blake or the Huts of America, imagines a geography over a century, over a century and a half ago, imagined a geography of black solidarity that linked the insurrectional projects of enslaved blacks in the US South with their counterparts on the island of Cuba, a land then under the colonial control of the Spanish empire. Some decades later, Anne Petrie's novel, Tituba of Salem Village, uh, published in 1967, takes a close look at the Barbadian background of the title character and her husband, John, starting with the moment when the captives learn from their mistress, Susanna Endicott, that because she was in financial straits, she had had to sell them to a certain Reverend Samuel Perry's. Thus, uh, they now belonged to Reverend Perry, who is going to be a minister in the Boston, in uh, in, in Boston, in the Bay Colony, um, in, in, the, in the the trip would follow in, immediately the, the next day. We get the sense that Barbados meant something to Tituba and her husband, despite their captivity there, uh, which adds depth to the experience awaiting them in New, in New England, where she would end up indicted of sorcery during the Salem witch trials. The 1953 um, uh, play, The Crucible by Arthur Miller had already featured Tituba among his dramatis personae, but Miller does not invest her with her due share of psychological death. The history of Caribbean errantry in connection with slavery or the quest for freedom goes back several centuries. The historical translocality of Caribbean life, the itinerancy of the Antillean person straddles many regions within the hemisphere and beyond. Suffice it to mention um, that the escape routes of runaway slaves from the, uh, from the Danish, um, French and English territories of colonial enslavement um, until the 1990s sought refuge in the Spanish colonial domains uh, quite often, creating a long pattern of, uh, of what uh, Carnegie, Professor Carnegie uh, calls uh, transfrontier marronage throughout the region. Practically all slaves in South Carolina uh, during the 17th century and nearly 20% of the enslaved population throughout the 18th century came from the Caribbean and in particular from Barbados. Um, beginning in the early 1900s, the cultural and intellectual presence of people of Caribbean and Latin American descent in the uh, uh, made itself felt in the United States through the political uh, stances of uh, figures such as Marcus Garvey uh, from Jamaica and his associates. Uh, his associates included uh, the likes of Dominican Lieutenant uh, 
Carlos Cooks, a man from uh, Samana Bay in the Dominican Republic, who contributed much energy and vision to the militant awakening that was subsequently evolved into a full-fledged black liberation movement. Uh, he, in fact, was the last, uh, basically, the last warrior standing, uh, holding aloft the, uh, the, uh, the banner of Garveyism. Winston James' uh, seminal study of the impact of Caribbean radicalism on the political agendas of the African popula African American population in the first third of the 20th century proves instructive in this regard. He surveys the legacies of Virgin Islander Hubert Harrison, known as the father of Harlem radicalism, Jamaican Wilfred Domingo, Barbadian Richard B. Moore, Surinamese uh, from Dutch Guyana, then uh, uh, as was called then, uh, Otto Huizwood, as well as Trinidad Trinidadian George Padmore, the Pan-Africanist uh, who become uh, known worldwide, uh, as well as uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, the Black Power Movement leader. Pointing to the majority consciousness they brought from their native lands, along with their previous migrations, distrust of church authority, uh, organizational experience, and memory of labor struggles, James does a sound job of contextualizing the radicalism of these uh, Caribbean migrants historically in their particular kind of political background. And he undertakes, um, as, as, he shows, as he shows the extent to which they contributed uh, to uh, uh, sort of uh, infusing energy, ideological energy to the black movement in the US, he also undertakes a, a persuasive refutation of the anti-Caribbean message in the famous volume, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, uh, the 1967 es uh, essay by Harold Cruz, who caustically charges West Indian migrants with insufficient solidarity toward the cause of their African-American brethren. Caribbean writers, thinkers, and scholars also played a key role in igniting the cultural revival known as the Harlem Renaissance. The names of, Jamaica, uh, of Jamaican poet uh, and then fiction writer um, and then uh, memoirist uh, Claude McKay, Guyanese fiction writer Eric Walrand, and last but uh, third in this case, uh, only, uh, only three I'm, I'm mentioning last in this case, uh, but certainly not least, uh, the bibliophile revolutionary um, Arturo Schomburg, uh, whose name, of course, will sound familiar. There are many other other, other names, uh, and I'll skip to this because I know we are uh, much uh, aware of, of our time constraints, and I'd like us to save some uh, moments for uh, Q&A. Um, but the presence of West Indian migrants um, in that crucial political and cultural moment in American history belongs in a larger narrative of the long history of Caribbean and Latin American migration, mobility, intra-regional uh, you know, uh, movements uh, and flows of out-migration. The process has been such that in our own time, nearly 5.5 million people left the Caribbean and the surrounding areas uh, from 1950 to 1950. 89 alone. Uh, glancing over the past 500 years, demographer Aaron Siegel noted uh, years ago that the Caribbean region has borne the deepest and most continuous impact from international migration of any region in the world. And I could uh, spend uh, some time naming famous um, African Americans uh, who have who have their, their Caribbean uh, or, 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 La or Latino background. Uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, James Weldon Johnson. Uh, where would the Harlem Renaissance be without him? Um, and so on. Uh, Shirley Chisholm, uh, the first African American Congress uh, Congresswoman, and the first uh, Black woman to run for president, uh, whose parents came from Barbados and uh, British Guyana. And of course, uh, let us not forget uh, uh, Malcolm X himself. Uh, we can even go back to the co colonial moment and find Jean-Baptiste Poidou Sablo, uh, a f founder of Chicago, uh, who was born in Haiti. Uh, Harry Balafonte, 
calypso artists and so on and so forth. And I just mentioned one, one other, two other, uh, three other names. Um, uh, Marcus, um, we know Marcus Garvey, but uh, Mrs. Garvey actually uh, was crucial in, in introducing a taste for Caribbean comedy um, and for calypso in, uh, in, in New York. Yeah. And so that's uh, basically, I'll, I'll stop there so that the time would allow me. Why well, am I producing an echo? Is it myself? Okay. 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 So, um, uh, so, um, so the history of Caribbean uh, errantry. Like, and, and when I say I'm focusing on the Caribbean, uh, which includes uh, that uh, Hispanophone side. Uh, Cuba, the uh, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and the Caribbean coast of many uh, Latin American countries. Yeah, uh, uh, with a focus on the Caribbean because it's easier. It's easier to uh, uh, sort of track from my from my data. But there's that that historical translocality of immigrant life. Yeah, the itinerancy of the of, of that person um, of the Caribbean person is fundamental uh, to understand uh, basically the, 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 the ways in which uh, the African-American experience has evolved in the 20th century. Uh, there are areas of there are areas of difficulty yeah, which can be um, framed in uh, I'll try to frame it in, in as careful uh, a set of terms as I can areas of difficulty which have to do with a certain uh, U.S. centric, a certain U.S. centric uh, a, a kind of uh, emphasis that uh, somehow demands of blacks from other places to perform their blackness in in in, in terms that are prescribed by the uh, African by the U.S. African American African American experience, and um, I will. Uh, here note uh, the difficulty, for instance, that uh, Schomburg encountered. Schomburg came to the uh, United States in 1891 uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an adult. And he came actually to advance the cause of uh, the independence movement of Cuba and Puerto Rico from the Spanish Empire. Yeah? Uh, when, a, when 1898 happened and the United States uh, this basically took the movement, the Cuban independence movement, away from from uh, from the original uh, you know, insurrection, you uh, know, insurrectionists, and basically turned it into into a an interimperial war. Yeah. Um, then uh, it was clear that uh, that he had to. Uh, it was clear to uh, Arturo Schomburg that he had to put his energies elsewhere, and he put it into uh, basically fortifying the black struggle with a focus on a culture, a knowledge, a knowledge production and recovery of the, uh, of the great heritage, um, of the great uh, African heritage of the entire uh, hemisphere. However, um, much as he contributed to the Harlem Renaissance and that center that we have, that we have um, in, in New York, uh, the Schomburg Center, uh, he still ended up uh, basically delinking from the his original colleagues in the Harlem Renaissance uh, because they, he 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 felt that he could not sell the notion that it was important to look at the African experience in Latin America, and so basically he became an Afro Latino after after having been uh, a full fledged black, yeah, uh, and and. And so basically, the, the, his last uh, years, uh, he spends uh, basically uh, uh, trying to produce knowledge that would instruct um, uh, African Americans about their brethren on, uh, on the other side, uh, on the other side of the of the hemisphere. And um, the, and, and I'll just close by saying that um, I, 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 because African Americans are 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 so centered in the in the United in in, in, in this kind of U.S. 
I mean, that, that, it is possible to actually, uh, it is possible to speculate about a certain um, U.S. essentialism, or a, a certain U.S. centric um, uh, exceptionalism that uh, uh, that everybody in the United States, even even, even minorities, inherit uh, from the Anglo tradition, yeah, and and, and that they apply to their co-ethnics elsewhere. Um, so um, Carlos Moore, for instance, uh, who came to Cuba, from Cuba, uh, basically became African American by learning he was black there, but he became black in the United States uh, once he was instructed by. And, uh, by Maya Angelou, how to be black, and he tells the story. Yes, and he tells. Thank you. Uh, I um, and so in closing, he tells the story in his uh, autobiography, uh, Pichon. Um, and finally, in the United States uh, uh, people looking at race in the Dominican Republic cannot understand it because they are looking always looking at it as a as a case that represents a direct contrast to Haiti. And they do not see that there is no such contrast, and that there is as much Negrophobia in Haiti as there is Hispanophilia in the Dominican Republic. Uh, so that picture that Henry Louis Gates presents at the beginning of his Black in Latin America project is simply uh, incomplete. Uh, and though, so um, uh, I'll open up uh, when, whenever the occasion uh, comes for us to have a conversation about any question I may have. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Silvio Torres Sayon. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Professor Dagmali uh, Wupshet. Great. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to participate in this landmark symposium, Making African America. It's a pleasure particularly to be on this panel with both dear friends and also scholars I've admired from afar. Also a pleasure to join you from afar, from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where it's approaching midnight. I was going to say good afternoon, but I'll say uh, good night or good day. Uh, my connection is a bit spotty, so I apologize in advance. You may not see me, but I hope you can hear me clearly. The title of my brief presentation is the question of diaspora, the ethics of blackness and Ethiopian perspective. One of the major developments in recent Ethiopian history is indeed the birth of a sizable Ethiopian diaspora. Ethiopians began to leave their country en masse in the wake of the Ethiopian revolution of 1974 and continue to do so today and have been dispersed all over the world from the United States to the United Arab Emirates Saudi Arabia to South Africa, how Ethiopians living outside of their native country contend with new national identities and cultures, and more broadly, the new experience of diaspora, of longing and belonging, of homeland and homelessness that all diaspora people contend with is a topic that demands a critical attention and one that Ethiopian studies in particular and Africana studies in general have to take up in substantive manner. One can argue, perhaps with a dose of exaggeration, but not that much, that no other experience has altered contemporary Ethiopian life more so than that of diaspora. For one, and to get to the most obvious point, to get the most obvious point out of the way, today's Ethiopian diaspora, today's Ethiopia cannot economically survive, even thrive. Can you all hear me? Yes, okay. Um, today's Ethiopian cannot economically survive, even thrive, without millions in remittances that flow back each year and fiscally shore up what remains a poor country. Unlike any other time in its long history, long, long history, Ethiopia's economic welfare is now tethered to its nationals living abroad. And maybe not as significant, but nonetheless important, is also the role Ethiopians living abroad have played in shaping Ethiopian politics since the 1970s. The Ethiopian student movement, which was so crucial in undoing imperial uh, power and ideology, brought down the reign of Emperor Haile Selassie, for instance, flourished through its international affiliates like the Ethiopian Student Union in North America. 
Subsequently, both the Derg communist regime and what succeeded it, Ethiopian People's Rev Revolutionary De Democratic Front, EPRDF, have faced fierce opposition from abroad, particularly in the United States, as exiled Ethiopians in America sought to mount viable opposition against these regimes and exert political pressure by using various media platforms. For example, I think of the role of Voice of America during the Derg years in the late 70s and 80s, censored in Ethiopia at the time, to ESAT, Ethiopian Satellite Television, headquartered in Washington, D.C., which has also been intermittently censored under EPR, the DF rule. Even today, the short reign of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed draws enormous support and growing and fierce opposition from Ethiopians scattered all over the U.S. In short, at the very least, different political organizations and alternate media infrastructure in the diaspora have played an important role in providing counter narratives and critiques of formal political power in Ethiopia over the last 50 years. But I'm not an economist nor a political scientist, so I'll leave it to colleagues in those fields to weigh the economic and political significance of the Ethiopian diaspora in shaping its contemporary history. I raise these points simply to signal the ways in which diaspora structurally undergirds contemporary Ethiopian life. Now, coming to my own field of expertise, then let me address the cultural significance of diaspora in the making of Ethiopian identity at home and abroad, particularly the US. When you arrive at Bole, Addis Ababa Bole International Airport, ask someone, anyone, from the customs agent issuing you entry visa to the bank teller ch changing dollars or euros to birth, from the airport security to the luggage handler, ask them, what does the word diaspora mean? And each one will be quick to give you an answer. In the last three decades, no other foreign word has found everyday currency in Ethiopia, more so than diaspora. In the Ethiopian context, diaspora refers to, on the one hand, immigrant Ethiopians who have settled abroad, and on the other, returnees, who've come back home either for short holiday visits or for good, like what we call those who've packed up and returned to resettle in their country of birth. Also, depending on tone, diaspora could be a descriptive term or a pejorative term. So you could say, so-and-so's diaspora, or you could say, Ugh, these diaspora, meaning uh, they've come back from abroad and are putting on posture. So you have to heed the tone of how someone pronounces that word. Now, unlike the conventional meaning of the word diaspora, which signals a people's physical dispersal or movement away from homeland, Ethiopians use the term to indicate both a movement away from and back to one's homeland, indeed confounding the term's unidirectional logic of departure without return. This local usage of diaspora is certainly counterintuitive to the established definition of the term, including the way we critically applied in the field of African American studies. In general, when we speak of the African diaspora, implied is a clear place of origin, that is Africa, and of dispersal, chiefly, you know, the Western Atlantic world, that the descendants of the Middle Passage have made their home. As a critical term then, diaspora has come to signify the historical conditions and the set of cultural practices that constitute modern black life outside of Africa, from majority black countries like Brazil and Jamaica to minority ones like the United States and Mexico. But rarely do we apply the term to characterize black experience within the continent until now, given our contemporary historical condition of large number, numbers of Africans living abroad, whose immediate familial and cultural ties to the continent remains unbroken, including the possibility of return to one's native land, which was something inconceivable to previous generation of diaspora Africans who crossed the Atlantic under conditions of chattel slavery. To be sure that people of African descent have returned back to Africa is not a new phenomenon. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, repatriated ex-slaves and free black people established Sierra Leone and Liberia. Following World War II, Rastafarians from the Caribbean repatriated to the town of Shashamene in Ethiopia, 
where Emperor Haile Selassie had granted 500 acres of land to show his gratitude to the black people in the Americas who came to fight alongside Ethiopia during the fascist invasion. And from its independence onward, Ghana has proved a continental alternative for a number of African diasporans, particularly African-American expatriates seeking home, most notably the towering African-American intellectual and Pan-Africanist of his generation, W.B. Du Bois, and most recently, the incomparable musician, songwriter, artist, Stevie Wonder, who announced a month ago his plans to repatriate to Ghana. So the repatriation and expatriation of people of African descent back to the continent is not unprecedented. Still, still, the conceptual terms of black movement at our disposal, diaspora, repatriation, and expatriation, for instance, do not fully account for the particular way the physical movement of contemporary Africans is redefining not only the theoretical parameters of a term like diaspora, but also the material and cultural conditions of both countries of departure and arrival. The term diaspora's counter-conventional meaning in Ethiopia, diaspora as both an experience of departure and one of return, provides, I believe, one important vantage point for understanding how the new Ethiopian and more broadly, the new African presence around the world, especially in the United States, demands us to come up with new critical conceptual terms to better guide our studies of the contemporary, including today's African America. Allow me to narrow my focus and consider the experience of Ethiopians in the United States. Since the US is the largest diaspora population of Ethiopians, in the last few decades, moreover, since the U.S. has replaced former colonial powers like France and England as the country of choice for Africans to make a new beginning. Sometimes called the new African-Americans or African -Amer American Africans, or what the Nigerian-American novelist Chim Chimamanda Adichie calls non-American Blacks, more Africans have come to the U.S. since 1965 than through the Middle Passage, and their experience has finally gained the creative and critical attention it merits. And when you look at several American cities today, the African presence is so palpable that today's Minneapolis would be unthinkable without Somalis, Houston without Nigerian, Harlem without its Senegalese, Washington DC and the DMV without Ethiopians. For instance, inconceivable today to think about food culture and cuisine in DC and the DMV, for instance, without Ethiopian food. A study of African immigrants in the US entails a critical look at how they contend with what it means to be black in contemporary uh, America. When it comes to theorizing race and immigration in the US, we now have a robust body of scholarship on how European immigrants became white in America. As James Baldwin succinctly puts it, the price of the ticket was to cease being Irish, cease being Greek, cease being Russian, cease being whatever you had been before to become white. And that is why this country says it's a white country and really believes it. Unquote. The history of European immigration to the US entailed a twofold disavowal. On the one hand, the erasure of one's identity of origin in order to become white and therefore American. And on the other, the repudiation and oppression of America's black population against which white Americanness falls legitimacy and legibility. If this twofold process of disavowal is the means by which Europeans become white American, then by what mechanism does the new African immigrant become black American? Is disavowal also constitutive of the new African immigrant as it is for the European? Given that Americanness is predicated on race, how do we theorize the process by which an Ethiopian, a Nigerian, a Sudanese, a Kenyan, or a Somali becomes categorically black in America? Racial classification is so fundamental to American society, whether it's white American identity that, that's idealized or a black one that's maligned, Americanness is defined by racial categorization nonetheless. To be American in short is to be a racialized subject. One has to be legible as a race person in order to be legally and culturally legible as an American. All immigrants discover this soon, right? This is a foreign concept for so many immigrants coming from African countries, where racial classification isn't an organizing feature of the nation state. So we have to think carefully through the, the process of racialization that African immigrants also continue, right, as part of the naturalization and assimilation process. So how does the African immigrant become a black American? 
since the race rules of America differ markedly from those of the diverse countries of the African continent, we cannot presume race to be a constant, right? Uh, across place, no racial identification is given, and so we have to wait how all black immigrants have to undergo the process of becoming black according to American racial norms. Hence, black, Amer black immigrants face a particular dilemma since they're forced to identify with the disesteemed of the country. And so much hinges on how we accept that identification as a burden or a boon. It doesn't matter where immigrants arrive from, Afghanistan or Angola, Mozambique or Myanmar, Serbia or Sudan, they know who is at the bottom of American society and all immigrants, including those who are black, quote unquote black, try to distinguish themselves from the population in a category so freighted with negative meaning. Immigrants who come to America to improve their station in life, in other words, do not want upon arrival to be placed at the margins, but it is precisely the people at the margins who have paved the way for black immigrants to find not only entry into the country, but also the possibility of a meaningful life exiled from home. Whoever appreciates that fact begins to see Black not as a category of disesteem, but the very category that has made America a reality and a possibility around which still coalesce the best ideals of the modern world. So one meaningful way of becoming Black for the African immigrant is to conceive of race not as an essential or prescriptive category, which applies to him by virtue of being African and phenotypically black and by virtue of being in America, but rather to think of race as an ethical category that constitutes, that continues to underwrite modernity's virtues. If James Baldwin is right that quote, white is absolutely a moral choice for there are no white people, unquote, then we have to consider too how we might conceive of black as a moral choice with its own set of principles, acts, and feelings. Let me conclude then. Uh, so I'm not naive. To accept blackness automatically as an ethical boon can be a tall order, since African immigrants like others in the world enthralled by Hollywood have fattened, or is it starved, our imagination with black stereotype and anti-African American sentiment. And in the same way that black Americans have come to see Africa, mainly through Hollywood's eyes. Africans' pictures of black Americans have been filmed through this Hollywood, through the same racist gaze. Not only that, leaving an all black country and coming to a majority white one, black immigrants are forced to contend with that peculiar sensation the boys so aptly defined over a century ago as double consciousness. This sense, quote, this sense of always looking at one's self through the eyes of others or measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity, unquote. African immigrants begin to realize or must realize if they are to survive America, that the gaze with which they hold black Americans upon arrival is the same one through which white America will view them in the new country. And either they have to liberate their gaze and begin to see African Americans without white contempt and pity or internalize those feelings and begin to see themselves according to standards inimical to their psychic welfare. Thus, as new Americans, how we forge an identity imbued with ethical and political meaning, that is how we choose to be black, is a timely question, a question we, we can begin to broach as we briefly, briefly sketched here, using our experience of the new African diaspora and a radical ethical traditions African Americans have formed over the last four centuries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Doug Wangi. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Mukoma Wangubi. Mukoma? Uh, 
Hello? Uh, I would like to add my thanks to Professor Julie Green, Kate Keene, uh, the University of Maryland, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture for this fantastic symposium. Uh, my talk today is about the interactions between African Americans and Jamaicans during the 20th century. And I have some anecdotes revealing these interactions I'd like to share with you in just a moment. Uh, and my anecdotes all share a few things in common. First, they reveal connections between African Americans and Jamaicans, like I said. Um, second, they reveal uh, they revolve around individuals um, with histories of international migration. Third, they have something to do with sharing music. And finally, and relatedly, these migrations and interactions in most cases led to new kinds of music being formed. Finding these connections has been the easy part. The more difficult part for me has been thinking about the significance of these movements and interactions. Um, so let me start with some anecdotes. Uh, and they're really just individual stories of people. Um, then I'll finish with what I consider the significance um, of the stories. Because I can't show images here, I created a tweet thread on Twitter uh, for anyone who would like some visual information related to my discussion. Um, on the tweet thread, you can also find a list of recommended music. So please uh, check out my pinned thread at my Twitter handle Jason P. McGraw, just J-A-S-O-N-P-M-C-G-R-A-W. Um, so my first anecdote or historical figure is singer, actor, civil rights activist, and global icon, Harry Belafonte. I'm starting with Belafonte because his life and art reveal important connections between African-American and Jamaican music. And in fact, Belafonte himself is a connector to and between my subsequent um, anecdotes. So Harry Belafonte was born in New York City in 1927 to Jamaican immigrants. He grew up in New York, but he also spent time in his parents' homeland of Jamaica as a child. So Belafonte moved back and forth between the U.S. and Jamaica in, a, in his childhood, and he really had a transnational childhood in the 1930s. So Jamaica offered Belafonte at least two things. One was black pride. So in fact, Belafonte's mother was a follower of Marcus Garvey, the black nationalist and Pan-Africanist leader from Jamaica. Second, uh, Jamaica offered Belafonte a love for music. Uh, he witnessed there how music animated daily life for many people he met. So Jamaica was Belafonte's first musical education and it was his first political education. And he writes about this in his memoir, if you're interested in learning more about that. So Belafonte came to the world's attention uh, in the Calypso craze as a singer, uh, and he was at the center of the Calypso craze in the 1950s. Calypso music is originally from um, Trinidad, but the craze of the 1950s was a North American creation. And in fact, this is where Belafonte's story connects with my next historical figure, my next anecdote. Uh, and that person is Jamaican Louise Bennett. If you created a list of top 10 most significant influential Jamaicans of the 20th century, Louise Bennett would be on your list. Bennett was a folklorist, storyteller, theater producer, writer, author, singer, and cultural activist. She shaped more aspects of Jamaican national culture than any other individual. In particular, through her art and activism, Bennett helped legitimize Jamaican, sometimes called Patois the spoken tongue and the nation language of the Jamaican people. Louise Bennett was also a migrant. Uh, like many educated Jamaicans, she made her way to London in the 1950s to further her studies. While in London, she worked for the BBC on the Caribbean service. And while in London as well, she recorded Jamaican songs. And these songs from the early 1950s are some of the first, some of the earliest recorded commercial uh, Jamaican songs ever made. But in 1954, Bennett moved to New York City. So Bennett belonged to Jamaica's cultural and educated elite, but she shared with working class Jamaicans a history of multiple migrations, like Carrie Belafonte and, and Belafonte's parents. Bennett settled in Harlem and she joined the local literati. She befriended Langston Hughes, 
uh, and Shirley uh, Graham Du Bois. Shirley Graham Du Bois, the writer, musician, activist, and later the wife of W.E.B. Du Bois. And while in New York City, Bennett also sang in public Jamaican songs at the Village Vanguard in um, Greenwich Village. At the, at the Vanguard, uh, she performed with Irving Burgey. Uh, Burgey is also known by his Calypsonian name, Lord Burgess. At the time the two performed together in at the Village Vanguard, uh, Burgey had just been hired to write songs for Harry Belafonte. Several of Burgey's compositions would go on to Belafonte's Calypso album from 1956. This is the first LP to sell more than a million copies. This was the beginning of the Calypso craze of the mid-1950s. Burgi learned several songs from Louise Bennett, songs that became some of Belafonte's most iconic, like Deo, better known as, better known as the banana, banana Boat song, uh, and Jamaica Farewell. Jamaica Farewell is a radical remake of the traditional Jamaican song, Iron Bar. Although Burgi downplays uh, Bennett's role in his own, uh, in his autobiography, Belafonte remembered Louise Bennett as, quote, our well of knowledge. The Calypso craze on the whole was a Jamaican African-American cultural production, production. Like I said, Calypso music hails from Trinidad, but the craze of the 1950s was, had only slight input from Trinidadians. Uh, obviously, the US mass culture and white controlled record labels, film studios, and television stations made it into the craze. But despite that, it was the very local level interactions and borrowings between Jamaicans and African-Americans that were at the root of the craze. Much of Jamaican's musical knowledge was filtered through interactions with black Americans, uh, black American artists like Burgi and Belafonte. Louise Bennett was just starting out in her career when she made this incredible, if mostly hidden impact on US mass culture. There were more moments of back and forth across borders in the Calypso craze, because eventually it reached back to Jamaica itself. Once in Jamaica, the global craze reshaped local music. So Jamaican folk music was called Mento, uh, but it was repackaged uh, as Calypso, even though the music called Calypso in the US was really often Mento. Uh, for instance, Lord Flea, a Jamaican Mento singer, rebranded himself as a Calypsonian in order to cash in on the craze. And then later on, nationalism took hold uh, and Jamaicans went, went back to calling their, their music Mento. The historical figures of my next anecdote are Veer and Lillian Johns. Veer Johns was born in the 1890s, and in the 1920s, he immigrated to New York City around the same time that Harry Belafonte's parents made the same journey. This is really the, the hidden great migration. As hundreds of thousands of African-Americans left the US South and headed to Northern cities, they were joined by tens of thousands of Caribbean migrants. This story is only sometimes acknowledged despite its impact on US cultural history. In New York, Veer Johns wrote for newspapers. He acted on the stage. He hosted a jazz and blues radio show. And he met and married Lillian May, an African-American actor, singer, and dancer from Brooklyn. Together, they immersed themselves in the jazz age. They drank with Cab Calloway in Lenox Avenue speakeasies, and they listened to Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong in local clubs. Then in the 1930s, Vera and Lillian Johns moved to Jamaica. This was in the same years that young Harry, Harry Belafonte was moving there too. The Johns hoped to instill a bit of the Harlem Renaissance in the island. And their main venture for this was called Opportunity Hour, which they explicitly modeled after Amateur Night at the Apollo Theater. Lillian Johns was the real force behind Opportunity Hour. She rehearsed contestants, she conducted the band during the shows, and she even performed on stage herself. Between 1939 and 1966, thousands of Jamaicans competed in the Opportunity Hour shows. But the Johns did more than just recreate Amateur Night at the Apollo in Jamaica. They also helped institutionalize rhythm and blues. As consumers of African-American music, Jamaicans needed no help. Since the 1920s, Jamaicans had embraced the blues and jazz buying music, dancing to, to American music. But in the 1950s, Opportunity Hour 
validated youth performance of rhythm and blues, doo-wop, and rock and roll. And Jamaica became an outpost of a Black American music, not just as consumers, but as producers. So if you're a fan of ska or reggae music from back in the day, then I guarantee you that your favorite artist performed at Opportunity Hour. So Laurel Aitken, Derek Harriet, John Holt, Millie Small, Delroy Wilson, Jimmy Cliff, and Bob Marley were just a few of the singers who, who auditioned in front of US-born Lillian Johns. Opportunity Hour became an incubator for the Jamaican music industry. So this is a story that Jamaicans know and scholars of Jamaican music know, but few elsewhere are likely to have heard of it. African-American music saturated Jamaica in the 1950s and 60s. So if you're interested, um, I suggest some Jamaican doo-wop in my tweet thread. And if you don't look at the credits, you would think you were listening to, to a group right off the street corner of Philadelphia circa 1958. There are at least two other hidden stories here with the Johns. Um, the first is um, African, um, the first African, uh, sorry. Uh, the first hidden story here is um, African-American migration to Jamaica. So since the age of Garvey, dozens and perhaps hundreds of African-Americans made Jamaica their home. Many played important roles in local life there. The second hidden story here is about hundreds, if not thousands of marriages between African-Americans and Jamaicans. So I wanna say more about that in just a second. So my final anecdote is more well known. Clive Campbell migrated from Jamaica to the Bronx in 1967. Uh, in the Bronx, uh, he, which had a growing Jamaican population, Campbell took the name DJ Cool Herc, uh, built his own sound system. Uh, and this is a story that is well known. This becomes the basis for hip hop coming out of the Bronx in the 1970s. Um, so I'm out of time, but he basically, Cool Herc basically reconnected, reinvented Jamaican musical practices in the Bronx. Um, I know I'm out of time, but I wanted to, I want to mention my significance here. Um, Harry Belafonte mentions in his memoir that his parents were undocumented immigrants to the U.S., and this caused a great deal of stress in their lives. Um, and this makes me think about um, there are over half a million undocumented Black uh, immigrants black people in the US today. Um, so as we you know, listen to our favorite music, we should think about um, how some of this uh, has been made by undocumented black people. 21 Savage, who was caught by ICE in 2019. Daniel Demille, better known as MF Doom, who was uh, denied re-entry into the US in 2010 because he was undocumented. So we should think about undocumented black people um, and how significant they've been to the music that we enjoy, even though we haven't appreciated their own lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is uh, Mukoma Wangubi. Yeah, I guess I did mute myself, so now you missed my opening joke. But in the interest of time, <laughs> no, in the interest of time, I cannot repeat my joke. You know, um, yeah, no, but, but 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 so I was thinking in terms of um, of Jason's presentation, and just yesterday I began my class uh, with playing Harry Belafonte. I've decided to bring every to begin every class for my African and African American course. Uh, to begin with music. So just yesterday we, we played um, uh, Harry Belafonte and, and, uh, and, 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 and um, Miriam Makeba, where they sing the song Malaika, right? You know, so now we talked a little bit about the, the trajectory of having a Jamaican-American, uh, you know, a South African anti-apartheid activist, right? All of them getting together through uh, the, 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 a, a different language which both of them don't speak. Um, sorry, sorry, my timer. Yeah, so so that, that, uh, for me, there's a certain fluidity that I admire when it comes to musicians, right? When you think about Malian blues, uh, 
you always have, you know, uh, musicians just getting their guitar and going to chill with Malian blues musicians and just jamming. Um, I have a novel coming out um, in May, I'm very hard dead with song, which talks, which, which talks about Ethiopian blues. So I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I couldn't hear um, Doug Maui's uh, presentation because I don't know if you talk about the Tizita, right? Tizita and James Baldwin, his essay. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant essay on, um, on how the Tizita, this form of Ethiopian blues are in conversation with, um, uh, with James Baldwin and consequently Af African-American blues and music and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, and then also my novel, um, Nairobi Hit, you know, that deals with the questions of Africans and African-Americans and, you know, where the, the, the main detective is African-American who goes to Kenya to investigate a murder case. So th these are questions that are always on my mind. But, but in, in preparing for today, I was thinking of what really animates my interest in the question of the relationship between Africans and African-Americans. And for myself, I go back to um, living in New Jersey. Uh, my, so I, I was born in Inverson, Illinois. Right. I was born in Boston, Illinois, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, but I grew up in Kenya. Then I came back in 1990 uh, to for college. Right, and I, I remember my first uh, my first cake party. Right, a cake party, you know, hanging out, blah blah blah, having fun, you know. And, and a fellow African American first year student comes up to me and asks, "Do Africans live on trees? Right, do we live on do we live on trees?" And so. You could you could actually say since 1990, I've been trying to understand the response I had and where the question came from, right? Um, because of course we meet racism every day. It is, racism is not everything. It is, it is, there's nothing about racism, but there was something so hurtful about that question uh, that that I, you could argue overreacted, and I, I guess so did he, uh, because we almost came to blows. But at some point, um, an, an older student came up to us, who was black as well. She came up to us and she said, look, you don't understand, you actually have history. You know, that, that was my takeaway point. You don't understand what you're doing. You know, it's, it's almost as if um, you know, you're acting out how racism wants you to act. So since then, uh, I've been thinking about the idea of, um, of how Africans and African-Americans see themselves through the lens of racism, right? Uh, or in the class I teach, we had, it begins with the question of, uh, in the syllabus, it begins with the question of, uh, of what happens when two people, what happens when two peoples who have double consciousnesses meet, right? So in the case of the African, of course, colonialism and, um, you know, and inferiority complexes that come with that, right? So uh, at the same time, the double consciousness, of course, from Du Bois, uh, talking about African Americans, right? So, so what happens? I'm, I'm always interested in that meeting. So, what happens when here I am? You know, I'm 19. Um, you, know, you know, first year in college. Here's the other guy. He's 19, first year in college, and we just meet, and within with just within just minutes of interaction, well, we are almost coming to blows, right? Um. So in the course of trying to answer that question of why I do chilling by a care good met with an African American in a way that wouldn't have fought a racist, you know, um, um, it, it's been an interesting journey. And the, the, the one thing I would, the one question, the one question that I think truly needs to be addressed between Africans and African Americans, even, even the questions of immigration. I mean, now you, you do have the question of um, uh, Eugene Robinson writing the book, uh, a disintegration showing that, um, you know, different, different types of blackness in the US, right? Uh, but before, before we even talk about solidarity, before we talk about all these questions that are so present to us, uh, as scholars and also well as, as living human beings, it's a question of who sold who, right? The question of slavery. Did Africans participate in slavery? Um, to what extent were they African? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, over to, to an extent, were they Africans who are saying, okay, I'm getting you my black brother or sister and I'm selling, selling you and I'm selling this slavery. To what extent do they see themselves as different nations? Um, but, 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 but at the heart of the questions of Africans and African Americans, there is a question that needs to be, um, needs to be talked about. So in the course of my own 
trying to answer that question, um, one of the books I teach uh, is my Angelou's All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. And in that book, she talks about going to Keta, Keta in Ghana, right? She, she spent some time in Ghana. Um, uh, she spent some time in Ghana, a number of years in Ghana, right? Where, you know, W. Du Bois was there, Malcolm X at some point came to visit. And we can talk about the solidarities, the political solidarities that, that you know, that, that were in place and happening, you know, starting from, I don't actually starting from the beginning of slavery. Right? Uh, but anyway, she talks about going to this little village called Keta. Um, Keta to me has become a metaphor, and I'll tell you why shortly. So she gets there. Um, in, at, at, and she finds this melancholic, that's, that's the way she describes it, uh, this melancholic town um, where slaves were being taken from, right? And when she gets there, she's, I, I don't know, in the interest of time, I won't, I, won't, I, won't get, I won't get into the whole spiel, but when she gets there, she finds a town that is still suffering from generations and generations, uh, generations after generation, uh, of of the trauma of having been the town that was getting sacked, right where the slaves were being taken from. Um, from well, so I, I visited Keta, and this is part of the difficulty of what I'm trying to write now, right? I visited Keta, uh, and it is truly the same. So my Angela was writing about it in the 1950s and 1960s. You know, and there I was two years ago. It is it is a town where the, the melancholy is palpable, right? Uh, because after all, in the same way you can inherit wealth, in the same way you can inherit yeah wealth and so on and so forth. So can you inherit trauma? So the, I don't know. I've never seen a town before where you could say uh, that even the way the people move, first it, it, it wasn't about. Okay, so can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yeah, so sorry about my internet connection. But, 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 but anyway, but, but the point about Keta is then, uh, it's a town where slaves were being taken from, where they were, they were being taken from, right? So meaning that the question of who sells who, who sold who, uh, can be easily addressed. Okay, maybe not easily, really. <laughs> maybe not easily, but it can be, we can also talk about um, mutual losses as well, right? Um, Okay, so I, I raise this point because it's it's salient, right? And you have uh, the, the late Ali Mazrui and uh, and Henry Louis Gates going back and forth about the question of slavery, right? But how come we don't talk about the uh, the losses, epigenetic, you know, that you know that we have inherited over the years, over generations of uh, of, 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 of of slaves, uh, of people who are getting raided. Shortly after I left Keta, I went to um, I went to Bristol uh, in London. Uh, sorry, checking the time. Okay, Bristol uh, was a slave trading town. Uh, you might know it now because of the Carl. What's his name? Um, Carlson. Yeah, Carlson. Yeah, um, who was a major slave trader. His statue got taken down, and they put a black a BLM activist and you know where, in, in place of that statue. But it but it really was a way of. Of seeing, okay, on the one hand, you have Keta that has been devastated generations. On the other hand, to see um, Bristol, where four generations have been benefiting from the same wealth that was taken away, right? Um, so I, I, I do feel, I, I, as much as we can talk about the solidarities, and, and I also want to take a, mo a moment to talk about um, about the hidden histories that Africans and African Americans don't know of each other, right? You know, so. In my own in, in my own example, that was very I don't know um, actually painful, very painful, was the realization, you know, and painful because as 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 a scholar who works on decoloniality and blah 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 blah, right? You know, so was the realization that Malcolm X had come to Kenya, uh, actually twice, uh, Zanzibar and also Tanzania, and this is not common knowledge. Right? It's, 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 we don't grow up knowing that Malcolm X came to Kenya. We don't grow up knowing that, uh, you know, that, that Malcolm X, uh, you know, went to Ghana and, and other places, right? But but the fact that he came to Kenya, he gave a speech at the parliament. I met with Pio Gamma Pinto, who was um, a trade unionist, uh, radical, 
Right, you know, but, but the fact that Malcolm X was in Kenya, and this is not something we grow up applauding, there isn't even a plaque that says Malcolm X was here, right? It does begin to show how, uh, to, to, my, to, to my mind, in, in a very visceral way, um, to the extent to which our histories are hidden from each other, right? So, of course, then to, to, to add to that, then I didn't grow up reading about uh, African American history. I didn't, I, I, yeah, actually, yeah, I don't remember reading about Malcolm X or Martin Luther King or the civil rights in the 1980s, 1990s, 1990s Kenya. And, and the same thing in the US. Like, I don't think uh, African Americans grow up learning about uh, these histories as well, right? So, but anyway, anyway to end, um, there, 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 there are several issues here, right? One is a history of political solidarity, right? A history, a history of political solidarity that then, uh, this is where then you talk about Malcolm X coming, in, uh, coming to the OAU and trying to uh, bring the US in front of the United Nations, United Nations for uh, human rights abuses, right? Uh, the solidarity of Du Bois uh, eventually dying in Ghana, but his Pan-Africanism, double consciousness, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, the solidarity of that leads Mandela to eventually come to the U.S. and saying, look, without the involvement of African-Americans in um, the African liberation struggles, right, it would have taken a long time to free South Africa. So, so, so there's, that, that's, that political solidarity is there and it's not known. So my question has been then, how are this, how, how is our not knowing really? How is our not knowing being used actually against, you know, Africans and African-Americans, right? You know, so consider this, right? Okay, so in, in Ethiopia, uh, sorry, in, um, in, 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 in Washington, DC, uh, there is the Little Ladis now, right? A little, I guess a part of the town that's called Little Ladis. But it was at the expense of and, 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 and I want to be careful here, right? You know, um, but it says it, it, it was an expense of essentially the Ethiopians in Little Addis gentrifying an area that was primarily African American, right? At some point, there was even an argument about um, uh, about uh, renaming a street, right? Renaming a street from a, from a, an African American name uh, to an Ethiopian name, and so on and so forth, right? Um, at the same time. In New Jersey, I mentioned earlier, you know, there should be fights between Africans and African Americans and struggles and so on and so forth. So, how do we reconcile this history of solidarity, uh, political solidarity, and so on and so forth? Beautiful, a uh, very beautiful and and complex, I should add, yeah, solidarity. Um, and at the same time, how how do we reconcile the day to day, the day to day um, tensions? One last thing, then I'll be quiet. All right, so, and then going, going, going back to Silvio's uh, to pre presentation, right? Like, how, to, what ex to what extent do we talk about um, the Cuban involvement, right? The Cuban involvement in Angola, uh, or Che Guevara in the Congo, but to, to what extent do we talk about Afro-Cubans and their involvement in uh, the struggles in Angola and elsewhere, historically? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ukoma. So we have time probably for one question and it's for the entire panel. Um, each of you talked about uh, the complexity of the um, exchanges, that it, there is no such thing as a unidirectional flow. Um, could you discuss uh, the back and forthness of African diasporic cultural production? That was a question from the audience for the entire panel. So sorry, I, I know my connection isn't that good, so I, I missed the beginning of, of, of the question. The, the question from the audience for the entire panel is, could you talk about um, the back and forthness of African diasporic cultural production? Um, and so, okay, since I guess I didn't hear the first part of the question, I should go first. Uh, but <laughs> okay, so it, like, I, I, I think to, to, to my mind, you can take it in different levels, right? That question, right? Um, one is political, it's sort of political solidarity I talked about, right? Where um, 
you have Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. There's this really beautiful scene uh, in the Maya Angelou's um, All God's Children, uh, The Traveling Shoes, where she's describing Malcolm X has come to Ghana, he has made his case in front of him, and at that point he's trying to, uh, you know, to, to, to bring African, African, African Americans into Ghana. And Malcolm X is leaving, uh, but he gets uh, escorted spontaneously, uh, escorted by ambassadors from uh, from Cuba, from I don't know Angola, from, I don't, I don't know, from, from different um, global South satellites, right? And they, yeah, so yeah, so they, they, they is that, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a political solidarity. There's a lit literary solidarity as well, right? Um, you know, and cultural, if you think about rap and so on and so forth. If you think about blues, you know, I, talk, I, I mentioned Tizita at the beginning, right? But you can talk about Malian blues, Tizita, uh, yeah, then rap and so on and so forth. Um, what, what, what I do think, though, that we need to, to really think about is also the things that divide us, right? The things we cannot take for granted and how uh, African immigrants in the U.S., our first generation, second generation, and so on and so forth, are being used as a buffer between uh, whites or whiteness and black Americans. You know, so so we, we become the uh, we become the um, uh, the model minority, as, as, as they used to say, of, of Asian Americans. Right? You know, so the, the African immigrant right now is cool. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to, um, because we've actually run out of time, take this opportunity to say that there have been a number of questions um, directed at the panelists. And these questions, will, we ask the audience to please share your questions in the chat. They'll be uh, shared with the panelists and we will uh, try to get the answers uh, posted. Um, this is clearly going to be an ongoing conversation, um, not just because the conference continues, but uh, we imagine that there will be other opportunities to follow up on the discussions taking place uh, during this conference. So um, I want to thank the panelists for these uh, wonderful talks and, um, and the audience, and to announce that session five, Global uh, Geographies and Constructions of Blackness will start at uh, 5 p.m. following the same um, link. There are six more sessions um, over the next two weeks. Uh, please check the full symposium schedule. Um, the link will be provided um, in, the, in the chat. Uh, thank you very much. And um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. <laughs>